Hello, and thank you for joining our live stream. We're here with Dr. Carl A. DiRimondo and Dr. John Henry. Both doctors are orthopedic surgeons with Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Big Care Clinic in Manitowoc. Today, we're hosting a Q&A type live stream uh, discussion on meniscus repair, its evolution, uh, where the procedure is likely going in the future. Uh, thank you for joining us today, doctors. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, let's learn a little bit about our, our experts. Uh, Dr. DiRimondo is board certified in orthopedic surgery and in sports medicine by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery. He's also fellowship trained in sports medicine. Uh, Dr. Henry holds similar credentials. He is board certified in orthopedic surgery and in sports medicine by the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery. He's also fellowship trained in sports medicine. Uh, visit our website for more on their backgrounds. Viewers, we wanna encourage you to feel free to ask any questions, uh, any knee related questions rather in the comments section. We'll do our best to answer your questions in real time. Uh, if we are unable to get to your questions though, uh, don't fret, uh, we will answer them after the live broadcast concludes. Um, and, uh, you, you know, if you're the shy type, you just like to watch and learn, um, maybe give us a like. That lets us know that you're enjoying the content and you're learning something today. We will appreciate that. Having said all that, gentlemen, let's get right into it. Uh, let's start with you, Dr. Henry. Uh, I believe most of us know the meniscus is part of the knee. Um, but can you explain what it is, what it does, and frankly, what happens when it's damaged? Yeah, the, the meniscus is a very important part of the knee, Emma, you're right. And um, it, uh, it's one of two types of cartilage in the knee. Um, so I, I brought this model to show you, uh, to show our, our audience and hopefully. Yeah. This. So here's the model. There's the thigh bone and the shin bone or femur tibia and the patella in the front. If we look inside, Articular cartilage is the stuff that lines the bones. It makes for that smooth, low friction, Teflon-like surface. And the meniscus are these structures here uh, in between the thigh bone, shin bone. And that's a different type of cartilage. Instead of being Teflon-like, it's more rubber-like. And it functions as a shock absorber, so to speak, between the femur and the tibia. And um, just like the shock absorbers in our cars, it it bears the uh, brunt of any uh, weight-bearing stress with our daily activities, and it's stressed more with athletic activities, and therefore it can be vulnerable to injury. When the meniscus is uh, injured or torn, then it um, usually causes a variety of, of uh, symptoms, and, and in most cases that uh, ends up needing some type of surgical treatment. Okay, okay. Um Dr. DiRomando, let's get you involved here. Uh, how do you diagnose a meniscus problem? Well, I mean, obviously for most patients uh, are in our office, the big complaint is there's something causing pain, causing swelling or, or mechanical symptoms. As Dr. Henry referred to, that's a, a piece of cartilage between the bones. So if something tears, there are nerve endings, but there's also a mechanical sensation that can occur. You know, for us, it's a good history. Someone describes, you know, an activity or maybe they twisted or, or did something to their knee and they have very localized pain. As you mentioned, we have two of these cartilages, one's towards the inside or medial side and one is towards the outside or lateral side. And oftentimes patients can take their finger and they'll point right to where it hurts. Uh -oh. Next, it's really the exam. You know, and obviously we do a very thorough exam of all of our patients. The number one most, you know, the most sensitive exam finding is when we press right on the knee where the meniscus is, it hurts. That's the number one, that's the most sensitive finding. Wow. But we do have some special tests on how we can twist and manipulate the knee that sometimes might generate a catching or a popping sensation. So that's kind of, you know, already once you've taken a good history and done an exam, most of us can are kind of leading down a path where this could very well be a meniscus injury. Then we can do some different diagnostic tests. Now, most people end up with x-rays. We particularly like to take x-rays where the patient is standing. There's going to be a space between the bone. We want to see how wide or how narrow that is to see how thick or how thin the cartilage is. You know, and that can give us some sense of you know, the health of the knee. Another thing that could be causing similar symptoms is when the cartilage thins or osteoarthritis. 
you know, the gold standard test to say, can we see the meniscus, diagnose a tear? If there's a tear, what does that tear shape? And, does, and, right. and, and what does that mean? Is it an MRI? That still would be the gold standard. And off of an MRI, we can certainly confirm tear. We can confirm location of tear. And from that, it also helps us to start planning a treatment plan. Okay. You know, so sticking with you, Dr. DiRamondo, uh, so when do you diagnose uh, a knee issue as a meniscus related issue, how do you determine the best course of action for, for treating that issue? Well, you know, we kind of have two buckets of these things. One bucket is, you know, there's been an injury, a sudden onset, you know, call it more of a traumatic situation. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other where it's more vague, nothing really happened, it's come on more gradually. You know, those are kind of two different subsets of people we look at. And then, like I said, as we're doing our, our diagnostic tests, you know, patients that have, you know, a moderate degree of osteoarthritis or more significant will probably have a meniscus tear with it. Something we might refer to more as a degenerative tear. It's coming along gradually. It's not necessarily probably the main source of pain. It's part of the whole situation. A lot of those patients, we'll, we'll manage them conservatively, whether that's modifications in activity, oral medications, physical therapy, maybe injection. Because many studies tell us in something that's more of a degenerative chronic process, we probably can manage that without an operation. Now, in a situation where maybe it's an acute injury or right. there's very minimal or no osteoarthritis, and so really that meniscus tear is the cause of it. And particularly when we're talking about a tear that is involving a, you know, certain areas of the meniscus that are placed at higher risk for tear progression, or hey, if we don't do something now, if the tear is far larger, we might end up not having an ability to fix it. And they tend to be the ones that, that end up with a surgical intervention. Okay. Uh, Dr. Henry, we're tossing to you. Uh, what's the most common issue you treat related to the meniscus? Uh, are we talking tears? Can you sprain a meniscus? Can you tweak it? What's the most common issue that you treat related to the meniscus? Yeah, when there's a problem with the meniscus, uh, it means that there's a tear. But as we'll get into a little bit later, there's all right. kinds of tears. I mean, that can range from um, uh, tears where the meniscus is separated from the tibia. We call it a root avulsion type tear. Usually that's in older individuals, and it's one of the rare types of tears in older middle-aged individuals that uh, need to be repaired. There are uh, degenerative tears like Dr. DiRamondo mentioned. Usually those are the most common in a middle-aged population. Those tears occur within the avascular part of the meniscus. So when we talk about treatment, um, the treatment of a meniscal tear really depends on uh, the blood supply to the, the part that's torn. So in uh, middle aged older individuals that have tears that need surgery, those tears generally need to be uh, removed as opposed to repaired. And then in younger individuals, um, especially younger athletes, uh, many tears occur in the vascular part of the meniscus, the part that has healing potential and can be uh, repaired. So the, 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 the issue with the meniscus, the problem with it is it, um, again, like the shock absorbers in our cars, it's vulnerable to injury or, or wear and tear. And um, when it's torn, it, it usually causes symptoms. And then beyond that, uh, the problem is it doesn't uh, heal itself, our body doesn't have the ability to heal a torn meniscus. Some people can compensate and get by without surgery, but those people that have ongoing problems that affect their quality of life, uh, then generally they're looking at a surgical type of treatment. Okay. Um, Dr. DiRamondo, and you, you kind of mentioned a, a little bit about this before uh, earlier, but what causes a meniscus tear? Um, obviously there's traumatic injury, mm -hmm. you talked about degenerative, uh, conditions. Right. What about hereditary or anything else that may contribute mm -hmm. to a meniscus tear? Well, first and foremost, I mean, most tears are secondary to just repetitive stress or strain. You know, like many of the tissues in our body, the meniscus over time loses some of its elasticity or resiliency. You know, every time you stand, walk, twist, or pivot, there's a, a significant amount of stress. You know, just when you're standing knee straight, the meniscus shares about 50% of the stress compared to the joint surface cartilage. When you're more squatting or kneeling, that's about 85%. So it sees a lot of, of stress because it's trying to dissipate that rather than having it concentrated directly to the joint surface. So that in and of itself, there can be attrition over time. And, and the term degenerative implies changes in the meniscus that made it less 
resilient, more more susceptible to tears, and combined with just repetitive stress. When we talk about traumatic injuries, and oftentimes these will be associated with other injuries of the knee. The, the most common is in uh, uh, an individual tears the major stabilizing ligament in the knee called the ACL or oh, sure. your cruciate ligament. Sure. Great, greater than 50% of patients with an ACL tear will have a meniscus tear, and that's just because how the bones have to shift, and they have to shift far enough to tear the ACL, they also can tear the, the, uh, the meniscus. That doesn't mean every time someone has a traumatic meniscus tear, they'll tear, tear a ligament, but you know, those are, you know, that's one of those injuries that we might often associate with a torn meniscus. Right. Um, so who is a good candidate for a meniscus repair? This is for you, Dr. Henry. Yeah, anytime that uh, there's good potential for healing in the setting of a meniscus, meniscus tear, uh, repair should be considered. And we can um, uh, make a, a fairly good assessment based on the MRI. That MRI generally tells us where the tear is located and the extent and also the health of, uh, of the, the knee in general. And um, uh, in situations where the, the meniscus tears in the vascular part, if you look at this photo here, right, that, that type of tear is in the inner third, the part of the meniscus that really has no good he healing uh, potential or, or no decent blood supply. And those tears just need to be trimmed out. That's just a cleanup type procedure, pretty quick and easy. But if the tear were in the far back of the meniscus, uh, the far left of, the, of this photo, for example, uh, those tears generally can be repaired and there are different techniques to accomplish that. There are other categories, um, uh, situations that are most common uh, for meniscus repair. In one, uh, you mentioned uh, hereditary. There actually is a, a hereditary condition called the um, discoid meniscus. Okay. Kids can be born with a meniscus that instead of being uh, uh, C-shaped, it's more uh, oval or circular. And um, uh, many times those have an abnormal attachment to the capsule and, and the meniscal repair is often uh, indicated. That would be younger kids typically. Um, in the uh, adolescents and young adult athletes, if they have an injury that tears their meniscus, often combined, like Dr. DiRamato mentioned, with ACL injury, uh, generally those are repairable. And then in the uh, older age, uh, and I'm, uh, what I mean older, middle age category, 40s, okay. 50s, 60s, uh, most meniscal tears in that, uh, that type of population are degenerative. Uh, if they need surgery, it's usually a trimming with the exception of that root tear that I mentioned. So if the meniscus uh, tears from its um, either front or more commonly back attachment to the tibia, the shin bone, we call it a root avulsion tear. And it's similar to if you um, cut the, the roots on a tree, the tree would become unstable, fall over. If you uh, detach the, the root attachment of a meniscus, it really becomes incompetent as a shock absorber and really causes devastating symptoms. But that's one of the uh, few types of tears in that middle aged population that can and should be repaired, not trimmed. I think one other thing to add to that is we, as we talk about maybe a patient 40s, 50s, maybe even to their 60s, sure. and Dr. Henry can attest to this, is we're also looking at the joint surface. So the image that's on the screen, the meniscus is the ribbon-like structure. The silver is a little probe that we're using right. to pull on it but the top of the screen would be the end of the thigh bone or femur and the bottom, the more flat is the shin bone or tibia and that off white color is the surface cartilage. So if we see partial to near almost full loss of that surface cartilage, meaning there's probably a significant arthritic component. Another reason, even though it could be a tear that looks like otherwise it would be good to repair, we realize that if there's already some moderate degree of osteoarthritis that right. if we go through the, the exercise of repairing it, it probably won't alter their clinical symptoms. Most times we know that before we even offer a patient a surgery, but every once in a while when you get in there, you might find the damage to the joint surface is more than maybe the x-rays or the MRI let on. Okay. We have a question that came in. So I'm gonna pose this to either of you, whoever feels comfortable tackling it. So can you perform meniscus replacement if someone is missing a lot of their meniscus? Uh, due to prior years that were cleaned up? Yeah, I, I can take this one because oh, I, um, I do some meniscus transplantation in my practice. So um, 
the, the indications for meniscus replacement or meniscus transplantation are uh, really quite uh, narrow or these uh, surgeries are fairly few and far between, even for those of us that do a lot of uh, joint preservation type work or cartilage work in the knee. Um, if, uh, if a younger individual with a knee that's otherwise healthy and stable has ongoing, continued, unacceptable symptoms, compromising quality of life due to meniscus deficiency, meaning they've, they've had a prior injury, unfortunately they lost the majority of their meniscus, it wasn't repairable at the time, right. and they just have ongoing symptoms because they don't have a shock absorber, the joint is being stressed abnormally or call it stress overload of that compartment then uh, they can be a, a, a good candidate for meniscus transplantation. And there have been all kinds of things that have been tried uh, in the synthetic realm. People have tried uh, putting uh, different polymers or rubber type material or all kinds of things been tried. And they've many, most of them have, if not all of them have failed dismally. Okay. Um, and uh, the, the, the the treatment that has shown success it's it's a, a technically challenging procedure but um, we we use a donor meniscus for this procedure and it's uh, size matched it doesn't have any um, uh, uh, any immune type uh, reaction within the knee or doesn't require uh, uh, concern about rejection uh, but uh, we we find a, a a donor meniscus that's healthy and of the appropriate size for the patient or the individual, and then we can put it in place. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Um, let's toss to you, Dr. Diarmando, and you may have alluded to this a little bit, but are, are people more likely to experience uh, a meniscus tear as they age? Does well, age I, have anything I, to do with it? The simple answer is yes. And it's just, you know, cycles and repetition. And, you know, we, we want, we run, we, we squat, we kneel, we twist, we pivot, you know, with over time, there's going to be some attrition. So, you know, the, one of the most common procedures and diagnosis is we, that we make anyone who treats knee conditions is a meniscus tear, you know, whether that's something that leads to surgery or whether that's something that's more non-surgical managed, we kind of told you that's a, you know, it depends on the type of the tear or the quality of the knee, the age of the patient but it's one of the most common diagnoses we make because it is susceptible to stress and strain because it is a major shock absorber in the knee. And as, as time goes on, there's attrition of it. Okay. Um, Dr. Henry, this is for you. And we talked a little bit about this, but I'm hoping you can get into it a little bit more. Uh, what other injuries can accompany a meniscus tear? Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, and any time uh, that we see a, a meniscus tear on MRI, we better be looking at the entire joint, not just um, at the meniscus. So in uh, younger individuals, the most common would be a ligament injury. Uh, ACL is a prime example. And right. at the time of treatment, both should be uh, treated together. In fact, when we do a meniscus repair, the uh, the best time to do it is at the time of ACL reconstruction. Uh, there, there are definitely uh, studies showing that um, uh, that optimizes the healing environment within the knee for the, the meniscus to, to go on to a successful healing. Um, as uh, we get older, as, as we've talked about uh, quite a bit, um, most meniscal tears have some degenerative, some wear and tear component. And then often uh, when we go in arthroscopically to address a meniscus tear, there's there's some cartilage damage. Some of that articular cartilage or Teflon-like cartilage is um, worn or torn or unstable, or there might be loose pieces floating around in the joint. So it's really important in my opinion uh, when we uh, treat these conditions surgically, and it's, this is almost always uh, arthroscopic uh, surgery, not open right. with right. the exceptions. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we try to get the joint uh, fixed up or cleaned up as best possible. We address the whole problem, not just the, the meniscus tear. Okay. Okay. Sticking with you, Dr. Henry, uh, what are symptoms of a meniscus tear? So if I go up for a basket and I land awkwardly and my knee kind of starts hurting, you know, what are, what are symptoms of a meniscus tear? Yeah. And this diagram that we have up uh, is helpful to consider this. So. Right. Generally, if a meniscus tears, there's going to be some symptoms at some point, and we've already talked with, with few exceptions, these things don't heal on their own. Right. Um, the symptoms can vary uh, by individual and, and uh, many times correlates with their activities, but um, 
but generally uh, they'll cause pain. Like Dr. Dier Dr. Diramondo mentioned, it's usually pain localized to that compartment, either inside or outside of the knee, but, but not always. Um, and then if you have an unstable tear, there can be mechanical symptoms. And by that we mean catching, locking, giving out or joint swelling. So this picture in the, the diagram to the top left, that little uh, like C-shaped uh, tear right. within the substance, something like that may cause some intermittent pain just related to certain more stressful activities like squatting or running perhaps. Sure. Uh, the pictures, uh, again on the top row, the second and third picture, center and right, those are, are definitely more unstable tears. Those have a greater potential to cause mechanical symptoms because those those flaps uh, can get caught. And that one in the far right or to the bottom right, uh, that, that piece, we call it a bucket handle, that piece can flip like it does or like it shows in the bottom right. And when that happens, the knee can actually lock up. People can come in and say, hey, my knee is stuck. And wow. they, they literally can't straighten it out. And when you see that, even without an MRI, uh, usually you know that it's a, a displaced or bucket handle type uh, meniscal tear. So it's usually pain uh, and in some degree of mechanical symptoms uh, for the majority of tears, uh, it's a problem that doesn't go away over time. The symptoms may vary day to day, but week to week, month to month, it typically worsens. And these unstable tears, they, they can cause some secondary damage to the cartilage. So there can be a price to pay for ongoing mechanical symptoms from a meniscal tear. It can cause uh, uh, secondary damage to the articular cartilage, the Teflon cartilage, and accelerate arthritis over time. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, so we have another question that came in. I'll toss this to you, Dr. DiRamondo. Um, it's a little long, but I'll give you the gist of it. <laughs> um, so it looks like uh, a couple of meniscus surgeries uh, somebody still has a lot of issues with the knee. Uh, they've done therapy and, you know, at the clinic and at home, but steps are still hard, long walks hurt, and even sitting for long periods of time uh, is painful. In a situation like that, obviously we're not trying to diagnose somebody that you haven't seen in clinic, but in a situation like that, what, uh, what is a person to do? Well, I mean, certainly they need to be in contact and, and follow up with their clinician. You know, as we've been discussing, depending on the age demographic that this is occurring in, and it's usually things like this are, if they've had multiple surgeries, they're certainly probably older than younger. It's the additional changes that the knee has gone through. You know, kind of starting from the beginning, we mentioned the meniscus is a shock absorber. It's right. part of the normal knee. If someone's had a tear, obviously they're symptomatic and they've undergone a procedure for which unfortunately it wasn't something amendable to repair and portions of that are taken out. It feels better in the short term, but with less of a shock absorber, you'll start to see some changes related to wearing of the joint surface. Even if there's been a second surgery, even more so. So certainly if there's still ongoing symptoms, depends how far out they are from surgery. If it's more recent, you wanna make sure there's not a complication more associated with the procedure, though that is rare. More likely it's because over time, the joint surface cartilage is wearing. And so in addition to the loss of the meniscus, they have osteoarthritis. And so that's certainly something can be assessed with an x-ray, good exam and otherwise, you know, making sure that when they came through a procedure, there weren't any residual loss of motion, loss of strength. So if there's a functional deficit, but more times than not, it's because of the other things that are going on inside the knee or the osteoarthritis that patients remain symptomatic. And then certainly there's a whole algorithm, non-surgical certainly first, or one can go through whether it's medicines, therapies, otherwise even injections that could certainly manage symptoms, control symptoms related to osteoarthritis, you know, improve quality of life for a time, right. you know, obviously trying to put off the need for any additional surgery or potentially in the future joint replacement if it ever comes to that. Uh, and that was gonna be my follow-up question, is that an option? Okay, very good. Yeah, certainly at the end of the day, if, if all conservative tre treatment has failed and it's deemed it's progressive osteoarthritis or loss of the joint surface cartilage, that's the definitive procedure. Okay, um, you had, and sticking with you, Dr. DiArmando, you had said that uh, uh, a meniscus cannot repair itself, correct? Well, I, I guess it's it's infrequent that probably it can completely repair itself. You know, there was a diagram as you saw up earlier and it showed the different little structures. Right. You know, and if, if we talk about the very edge and Dr. Henry alluded to this, if you can kind of break the, the cross section of the meniscus into thirds, the outer third or the, the part that's closest to the lining of the joint called the capsule, we kind of call it the red zone. The red zone means there's blood flow. So small tears uh -huh. in that area, 
they have the potential to truly heal, meaning they heal and you know, over time you would probably not be able to find that tear. Okay. Probably more often, it might be that somebody has a small tear, it occurs initially, there's pain, there's swelling, but it tends to settle down. It may never go away, but for a period of time, it becomes less symptomatic or asymptomatic. You know, down the road, could it become symptomatic? Yes. When you see the tear and, and there was the initial diagram where there was a picture inside the knee joint and it's right. out in this area that we call the white zone, white meaning there's no blood flow whatsoever. You know, there's no way they truly heal. Uh, as I say, if it's small enough, it may become less symptomatic, but it probably it's a matter of time before something will lead to that tear becoming larger and then creating whether that's pain, swelling or mechanical symptoms. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Henry, let's get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts here. Um, so what is involved in meniscus repair surgery? Like what happens? Um, let, let me first just mention what we do in the more common scenario where sure. we trim out a torn meniscus or do a partial meniscectomy. And that's essentially just removing the part that's torn getting rid of the flap and leaving a stable remnant, but we try to leave as much of a healthy meniscus as possible. That, that's an all important goal. So very different from uh, like pre-arthroscopy days before Dr. Diramondo and I started our practice way back. Uh, if someone had a symptomatic meniscal tear, they have an open surgery and the entire meniscus would be removed. I right. uh, thought was that meniscus was kind of like an appendix, just an unnecessary piece <laughs> of tissue. And most people did fine short term, but long term developed arthritis. Right. So we, we definitely have a goal of uh, preserving as much healthy meniscus as possible. And it's along that uh, line of thought that any meniscus that's repairable generally will repair it. And the treatment has evolved quite a bit with our uh, arthroscopic technology. So we used to do a lot of um, open repairs. We'd have a scope in the joint to look at the tear, and then we have an open incision on the outside of the knee and then pass sutures, and that, that's a, a very good repair. In fact, some, some people still consider it the gold standard. We now have some different tools where we can do the uh, procedure, a uh, meniscal repair surgery, all inside the joint or all arthroscopic. And basically sure. we have um, uh, very fine needles that we can put in the joint through small incisions in the skin that allow us to deploy sutures across the tear. And then there are devices that can uh, tension the suture to bring the tear back together. Um, that, that's for uh, the majority of meniscal tears that are amenable to repair. Uh, the, the difference would be with a, a root avulsion tear that I mentioned. In that case, then we're uh, drilling holes in the bone, passing sutures around the torn part of the meniscus, bringing the sutures over the bone and then tying it over a little uh, button outside uh, the, the shin bone. Um, but in, in either case, the, the goal is to restore the anatomy as close to uh, how it should be as, as possible. And then the question becomes, what do you do after that? And um, I, I think you have a question for Dr. Diermondo about the, uh, the recovery of the therapy. Right. But the other question is, uh, how do you optimize the healing potential? And, and there are many factors that uh, are important to consider, uh, some uh, within the patient's own control, things like um, following restrictions, not, not putting too much stress on the repair, having a proper diet, uh, that they have adequate nutrition, their body has the, uh, the nutrients that it needs to heal properly. Uh, not smoking is a big deal. Uh, people that smoke really compromise their ability to heal tissue right. like this. And then there's a, a, a bit of a, of a unknown factor with um, uh, biological augmentation, so to speak, uh, and some some surgeons, uh, particularly at academic centers, are using or experimenting with things like stem cells or platelet-rich plasma, oh, yeah. or other devices that may give Mother Nature a little boost to help with the healing process. But bottom line, the jury's still out. Uh, we don't quite uh, know how best to use some of those uh, treatments quite yet. Okay. Okay. Dr. Diarmando, uh, do meniscus patients require physical therapy? Well, I mean, part of the recovery, you know, after meniscus surgery is protection, as Dr. Henry mentioned. And for the majority of the tears that we're repairing, you know, the part that we're repairing wasn't stable to start with. And we're trying to create a stable situation with the different, you know, repair techniques and technology. So most individuals need to be non-weight bearing for a period of time. Sure. Kind of the overall kind of if you and there's various rehab techniques, but it's about a six week period of time where most individuals are going to have some limits, whether it's non-weight bearing, partial weight bearing, 
some limits in knee range of motion. As I mentioned, the farther back you bend the knee, the more we're stressing the meniscus. So we're going to watch how far back we bend the knee. Early on, a patient might need some therapy to teach them how to be compliant with those restrictions. Okay. But there's not much we're doing other than keeping their weight off of it. Oftentimes, there's a brace that might limit motion. Now, if we're out past or at that point where we're going to start to lift some of those restrictions, obviously, you know, the trade-off is during that period of time while we're protecting things, you know, there may be some loss of muscle mass, there may be some loss right. of joint motion. Then I think the physical therapy is valuable to start getting back full motion, restoring strength, guiding a patient on appropriately, how do you restore normal walking pattern and exercise? You know, typically if you're talking recovery time and it's probably in here somewhere, you know, and, and my gestalt yeah. tell patients, the first two weeks, six weeks is the most protective period. The next six weeks, we're trying to restore full motion, kind of get back to full strength, low impact or non, you know, minimal impact, walking, biking, you know, elliptical trainer, maybe swimming to some degree. You know, 12 weeks out, if all looks good clinically, no pain, full motion, no right. swelling, we start to introduce whether it's the running and, and impact type activities, okay. de depending on what they're trying to get back to. You right. know, that can be a four to six month journey in some situations, depending on what else was done at the time of the meniscus repair. Okay. Okay. Well, to clarify, uh, you're talking about after meniscal repair. What, what about after just um, partial meniscectomy? So a, a partial meniscectomy, so when I, when I have a patient that we're not sure until we get in there sometimes, it's the, the one track is the repair, and you've heard that. The other track is get in, trim it out, like taking a stone out of your shoe. Right. So that's, a, that's a medial weight bearing. There's no restrictions in range of motion. Most people are using crutches for a few days to a week. Okay. Range of motion initiated right away. You know, whole goal is to get over the initial swelling. Now, that recovery time back to full activities, including athletics, could be four to six weeks. Okay. All right. Really good. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're just joining us, we're here with Dr. Carl A. Girimondo and Dr. John Henry. Both doctors are orthopedic surgeons with Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Bay Care Clinic in Manitowoc. We're hosting this Q&A type session focused on meniscus repair. Uh, we encourage you, our viewers, to feel free to jump into the conversation with your questions. Uh, post them in the comment section. Gentlemen, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, and let's focus on meniscus repair as a procedure. Uh, Dr. Henry, I'm glad you said this earlier, but yes, it, it, it was my understanding that very early on, uh, surgeons would completely remove the problematic meniscus. Um, and like you said, that turns out that it uh, resulted in arthritis in many people who underwent that procedure. Clearly things have changed significantly since then. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, Dr. Girmando, in your, in your career, how much have you witnessed an evolution in how meniscus repair is performed? Well, I think it's been significant. And both Dr. Henry and I are, you know, working in our 20 this uh, plus year of practice. So, you know, we've kind of trained at the same time with the same techniques. And he mentioned some of those already, you know, these techniques where there's incisions made adjacent to the side where the meniscus is torn, needles and thread and things like that, which are still available, but we're certainly the gold standard. You know, this concept of a root tear, you know, when we first came into practice, no, really, no one really understood that. Fast forward to where we are now, right. and certainly with, you know, medical technology and, and, and technique, Inst instruments and implants that allow us to get to areas where we couldn't get to before, particularly where it's a little less involved surgically, both for the surgeon and the patient, has opened up the possibility, and I say possibility of doing these repairs, always we, we as a surgeon have to kind of keep in mind, I don't want to put the technology, all these neat little tools and toys ahead of reason, right. is this really going to heal? Because right. at the end of the day, it's still biology and you still have to remember, you know, what's the goal here? Even now, and even in this, you know, in this time, you know, as I attend meetings, our understanding of, of the root tear, for example, and other ligaments that support the meniscus is still evolving. So we're not done learning. We're not done as a, as a uh, organization orthopedically, probably coming up with better ways to repair or understand a tear. And as Dr. Henry alluded, I think some of the big things in you know, the immediate or certainly more long-term future is how do we enhance biology of healing, meniscus right. tissue, and other orthopedic you know, things. Right. Well, Dr. Henry, let me toss this to you. Uh, where do you see this procedure, uh, meniscus repair, going in the future? I mean, what improvements or new ways of treating this condition do you see on the horizon? Or maybe you've already started utilizing some of these new techniques or tools. 
Um, what do you see in the future? Well, there's a, a holy grail that um, we love to have in orthopedics that um, I think is uh, uh, still a long ways out, and that's to have a biological treatment for a lot of these cartilage, which includes meniscal problems. And um, it'd be nice if someone had uh, cartilage damage <clears throat> or a meniscal tear, and we had the ability to, for example, inject a substance inside the knee, and that would magically right. cause the area to heal. Right. That's the holy grail, but uh, we're a long ways away from that. I, I don't expect to see that in my lifetime, um, but perhaps someday. That, that's that's the ideal. Okay. But we do have things like stem cells and uh, platelet-rich plasma, right? Which are taken from the individual, from from that patient, that that have potential. Uh, that's Mother Nature's recipe for healing a variety of conditions. We just don't really know how to use them yet. So I, I mentioned uh, earlier that um, stem cells and PRP are sometimes added to a meniscal repair, um, either at the time of the procedure or afterwards just by injection in the joint. But we really don't have uh, convincing evidence yet that it makes a significant difference for healing or restoring uh, individuals' quality of life. And um, there, there's still a lot that we need to learn but that that's where meniscus repair is heading like many things in orthopedics and, and medicine in general it, it's really all about the biology okay uh dr giramondo I'm, I'm sure you've got some insights to share as well anything to add to that well i think i, I would like to add that certainly you know we approach each each patient you know as individually and obviously as we're talking specific to the knee and the meniscus you know i think with you know, what we've discussed already are ways to diagnose and understand, you know, is there a tear? What does that tear mean? Better understanding of what that type of tear, what impact that tear might have on the knee short term and long term. You know, certainly the, the initial approach is we'd love to preserve every joint. I think that's the approach we want right. to take. Now, that's not always possible. And even when we do try, and I tell patients we're repairing meniscus, it's not 100% healing rates. You know, as Dr. Henry alluded, the highest healing rates are in, in uh, repairs done in addition to a ligament stabilization procedure. Some of the theories behind that is the blood and some of the, the marrow, which is bone, you know, from bone that's in the knee joint, maybe some of these biologic type enhancements. You know, obviously the goal is to try to do everything we can to possibly restore a patient's quality of life, whether that'll be through a simple get in, get out, clean up a small tear, and that's what's best for the patient whether that's through a repair with appropriate techniques, technology, and rehab. You know, I think we've come a long way where there's a greater percentage that I can offer repair and feel confident I'm offering the right procedure. Right. Than maybe there was 10 to 15 years ago. Okay, great. This has been great information today, gentlemen. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Dr. DiRamondo, what's the key message you hope people come away with uh, from today's conversation? You know, knee pain, swelling, and mechanical symptoms, you don't have to live with them. You know, most times if it's a meniscus tear, it's something that can be dealt with through a, a less invasive arthroscopic procedure that restores quality of life. In the face of something where the rehab might be a little longer on the front end, but the upside is you get to keep your joint cartilage, it's worth it. I'd rather have you come in early than come in late where there's only one choice, which is to take right. it out. Because once we take it out, we can't put it back or it's, you know, in, in rare indications, can you have a transplant? And unfortunately that leads to wearing out of the knee joint. Right, right. Dr. Henry, any anything to add? Yeah, I'll just add that uh, by far the most common patient that I see uh, that with meniscal problems is in that middle age category. And um, uh, those of us that uh, tear our meniscus and need surgery are, are going to require partial meniscectomy, not repair. And uh, when I talk to patients about this, many times they're troubled that, that we would go in there and, and take out their meniscus and have to just spend a bit of time, yeah. like we talked about earlier, that uh, we're really just getting rid of the tear, we're not removing the whole meniscus, and that the goal is really to preserve their joint as best possible. And uh, with, with that understanding and that philosophy, most patients will do well. Uh, Dr. Giramondo mentioned the analogy. Uh, many of these unstable meniscus tears can be like having a pebble in your shoe. It can be a very significant mechanical irritant. And if we just get rid of the tear and preserve the healthy meniscus, 
get the joint cleaned up as best possible. Most people will do well to get their quality of life back in a relatively quick fashion, but some patients will have ongoing arthritis type symptoms or, or have an accelerated path to arthritis in the future. So that requires some counseling as well. And, and I just uh, typically I'll, I'll warn patients or just advise them that if they should have ongoing symptoms, we can help them compensate for that. Or if it's an unlikely situation way down the road, arthritis becomes a primary issue, then there's always knee replacement. But um, it's, it's worth having a conversation with each individual. Treatment is definitely individualized. Great. Uh, we actually have a, a question that just came in real quick. So whoever feels uh, uh, qualified to, to tackle that, um, what is the best way to preserve the knee after having meniscectomy? Well, I think, I mean, I can, I'll mention, I'm sure, John, you can, you can in, in join in. You know, we learn a lot by doing an arthroscopic procedure. Not only do we look at the area where the meniscus tear is, we look at the entire inside of the knee and get a better sense of, you know, how much surface cartilage is, is wearing and the like. Certainly, we try to get our patients back to the level of activity they were before, and that's the majority of patients, even as Dr. Henry mentioned, that you know, just have a small trimming of it. Now, if we're talking more of us in the middle age group that already have maybe some osteoarthritis, and as we counsel our patients, you know, how can you preserve your knee going forward? It's obviously still being active, still exercising, maybe modifying the amount of impact, you know, higher versus medium versus low, you know, good health and choices as far as, you know, eating, diet, exercise, controlling one's weight. You know, for every pound of body weight, there's some studies that would say that's two to three pounds of pressure inside the knee. Right. So those are all little things to say, once there's been a meniscus tear, once treatment's been rendered, we have a better understanding of the knee health. We try to guide our patients. We want them to be active. You know, you take pain away from a patient, they'll do what they feel comfortable doing. But if they're willing to listen to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm 52, I'd prefer not to have a joint replacement if, if all, ever, or certainly not for many years, that's where we can intervene with some suggestions on, on activities that might put less stress across the knee. Okay, good, great stuff. Uh, we thank you for your time today, gentlemen. A um, couple of quick things. Easy enough to get a hold of you guys. If uh, if somebody has uh, an orthopedics and sports medicine related condition, easy enough to call the call the clinic. Go online, book an appointment. Correct? Call us, email us. We'll get you in. Okay. No referrals needed. Typically not, and if there is that situation, we usually can work with our primary care provider to coordinate that referral. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Um, and thank you, viewers, for joining us today. If you have additional questions for Drs. DiRamondo or Dr. Henry, uh, please ask them in the comment section. We will continue to answer them online. Uh, both doctors are orthopedic surgeons with Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Baycare Clinic in Manitowoc. Uh, to learn more about the doctors or their experience or to request an appointment, please visit baycare.net. Uh, thank you so much again and enjoy the rest of your day.